Good morning and welcome once again to St. Francis by the Lake. If you're here in our midst, oh, it is so good to see your faces. I have missed them. And if you're at home, we pray that you've been able to find our website, find uh, our bulletin, and that either uh, you've put it up on the screen or somehow made it available to you so that you can follow along and participate uh, to the best of your abilities. Normally, we would warmly welcome you and treat you to an experience that uh, many people say is uh, irrepeatable and unreproducible. We're experimenting with hospitality. We have been for many, many years, and frankly, I think we're getting better and better at it, uh, even in this time of physical distancing. I want to emphasize um, something that we often overlook. On our cover sheet, we say that we, St. Francis by the Lake, are a community that's grounded in our desire to be a loving, caring, and safe place, where together we can learn and live out our Christian faith in response to the love that we've received and that we continually receive from Christ Jesus. We're constantly growing in our recognition that we're broken. We're not here because we're perfect. And we're experiencing what it means to be reconciled and restored because of God's grace. And we have found in Scripture and in the sacraments and in our fellowship the gifts of life, hope, mercy, love, and joy. And we invite any and all to come and be part of that with us. If you're interested in Pat Pablum, ready-made answers, sort of like a microwave dinner, that's not what you'll find here. We, uh, we take a long time because we all take a long time to learn. Today is the uh, sixth, seventh Sunday in the season of Pentecost, common time. Thank you, John, for that beautiful Bach prelude. Blessed Jesus at thy word. Let's move on and begin our worship with a hymn, Almighty God, your word is cast, sung to the tune Dundee. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 3. God, your word is cast like seed upon the ground. Now let the dew of heaven descend and righteous fruits abound. Let not our selfishness and Root in every heart to bring forth fruits of love. Let not the world's deceitful cares the rising plant destroy, but let it yield a hundredfold the fruits of peace and joy. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desire is known, and from you no secrets are hid. 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we'll say the Gloria Nixalsis, which is found beginning in the middle of page two of your bulletin. Saying together, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our portion of Psalm 65 today is verses 9 through 14. This can be found, found on page 3 of your bulletin or on page 673 of the Book of Common Prayer. We shall read in unison. Psalm 65, verses 9 through 14. You visit the, the earth and, and water, water it abundantly. It abundantly. You make, you it, make very it very plenteous. plenteous. The, river the river of God, of God is full of water. water. You, you prepare, prepare the grain, the for so, so you provide, provide for the, the earth. earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. <clears throat> Our second reading is from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Together we'll stand and sing hymn 440 found on page four of your bulletin, Blessed Jesus at Thy Word. Blessed Jesus at Thy Word. 
are gathered all to hear Thee. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to see and love and By thy teachings, pure and holy, drawn from earth to love thee The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the, of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but only endures for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and the fruit of our lives bless you, be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So in Matthew, uh, we have now approached that time of year where we're going to get a lot of Jesus' teaching, and here we get some parables. Today, actually, just one parable, but it's um, sandwiched. Did you notice that we skipped verses 10 through 17 in this uh, scripture passage? Well, today's gospel, I think, is a bit too familiar for us. Um, and so rather than 
calling this or thinking about this as the sower sowing seed, I like to think of it as the parable of the four soils, the parable of the four dirts. It's pretty fairly easy to remember because of this uh, vivid description that we have. We, we picture an ancient farmer striding through a rough field uh, with a bag hanging on one side, scattering handfuls of seed, uh, sort of a first century Johnny Appleseed. And we imagine a, a wide angle view of this field with birds flying over and hard packed paths and stones in shallow earth and thorny weeds threatening menacingly. And that's okay. It gets us into the context, but please, Let's dispense right now with the lecture about ancient agricultural practices. What do you think? Anybody want to say amen to dispensing with ancient agricultural practices? I love to talk about ancient agricultural practices. If you want, I could... Oh, you... no? Okay. Well, that's good because Jesus isn't talking about agriculture. Jesus took a familiar activity, I mean like... Many of us would think of um, a lawnmower, mowing a lawn. Jesus took a familiar activity, and he used that activity to illustrate something vastly more important for our lives. So from that vantage point, today's gospel lesson is as important for us as it was 2,000 years ago. And thank goodness, because agriculture is a whole lot different from then than it is now, right? But... Dirt is not different, and we are not different. Jesus is still talking to us about discipleship, being a follower, a devotee, being a student, a pupil, having a master, a teacher, a guide. Let me pause to observe that if we tried to apply this parable to our lives, um, the deck is stacked against us. I mean, there are three kinds of bad soil here, and only one that's good. Not very good odds, right? You want to try and follow the Christian life? Don't I consistently remind us that the Christian life is challenging? Christian life is challenging. It's not easy. And today's challenge is that Jesus' parable can help us discipline our lives and provide helpful introspection if we have the courage to walk the walk. In uh, that passage from St. Paul, he says, you are to walk in Christian life. Not just stand around, but move in it and with it. Having said that, if we have the courage to examine our lives in light of these four kinds of soils, we can become more like, more of, what God hopes for us. Having said that, I remember something C.H. Dodd wrote a long time ago. He said that parables leave the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application that it teases the mind into active thought. Remember what I said about microwave meals? Active thought takes time. And so parables have more in common with koans, with probing uncompromising questions, than they do with answers. 
parables are Jesus' way of asking the questions that God has always asked of humanity. Remember one of the very first questions? Hey, Adam, where are you? And then usually, later on, and throughout Scripture, what have you done? <laughs> and finally, when we're responding, one of our favorite questions is, whom shall I send? The way we actively think, reflect, meditate on these questions is the way we provide answers to the Lord for the questions that are constantly in our lives. And so before I ask you if you're ready, let me just comment that this is one of those rare times when I'm really glad that this is being recorded. Um, we're going to want to review these questions uh, and I'll probably speak quickly enough that you're not even going to be able to write down notes. But I hope that what happens here sparks your mind into thinking actively about the four kinds of soil and these questions that will help us in our relationship with the Lord. Ready? How do we clean out the rocks and the weeds that infect us? How do we avoid pathways that are useless? What spiritual practices will help us become well-tilled, well-fertilized soil? What can we do to help God's seed take root in us and empower us to produce loving, spirit-filled fruit, or as the gospel says, grain. How do we live so that our lives are more of a, a benefit to the world? How do we live so that what God bestows upon us doesn't fall among weeds or rocks or on worthless paths? So let's look first at the path. What are the aspects of our lives that tend to be so hard-packed that God can't break in? Where are our blind spots? What spiritual necessities do we tend to avoid? What social and psychological crust keeps us from opening up so that the seed can take root, send out shoots, and produce fruit? Are we apathetic to the cries of humans in need? I mean, we respond instantly to those ads on TV about the puppies and the kitties, but when those children show up, we change the channel. What do we hear but don't listen to? What tricks of the mind do we play to protect ourselves from becoming intimate? Will we soften our hardness to allow God to cultivate our hearts and minds and motivate us for the sake of the kingdom? The shallow ground. Where do we find in ourselves spiritual and emotional shallowness? Remember a woman in a former community that I lived in, and uh, the whole community had, had mobilized to respond to people on the coast who'd been through a hurricane. And a, a parishioner of mine came to me and said, I... I don't know what to do about this. I just called this woman that I know really well, and I asked her if she could come and help us, and she said no, she couldn't come because she had to study for her Bible class the next week. Will we always sit and never rise in order to enter the harvest? 
In what ways do we lack commitment to God and to God's cause? When do we speak big but act little? When do we promise God things and not keep our word to him? I think recently about, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? And then I know parenthetically in our minds we say, of course, God means the ones that think like us, look like us, act like us, dress like us, eat like us, live like us. End of parentheses. When have we been flashes in the pan without cooking up anything for God's good? Do we grab hold of new causes that come along and then not follow through? How do our well-intentioned promises fail to materialize? What can we do to reach a, a greater depth of character and find intentionality and integrity in our faithfulness? Number three, the thorns. What distractions do we allow that keep us from doing the will of God? How does our busyness with one thing or another keep us from following Jesus? I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, you know, for years I said, oh, I'm going to do that when I've got more time on my hands. And now that I've got all this time on my hands because of our, our, our social distancing, I'm still not doing it. What's wrong with me? Well, well, what's choking? What saps our spiritual energy? You know, if you save your prayers to the very end, right before you go to sleep, Sometimes you fall asleep before you finish your prayers. Now, that's not always a bad thing, but wouldn't you like to finish your prayers? Which weeds threaten to choke us? What temptations stand between us and God? Materialism? Desire for power? Lust for control? Vanity of popularity and success in other people's eyes? My personal favorite, the refrigerator. What do we need to eliminate that feeds off of, that distracts, that destroys the good that we would do? What fears do we choose to not face? What risks will we not take because we're either intimidated or we're too comfortable? How do we th follow through on the mandate to love God completely and love our neighbors as ourselves? How well we examine ourselves. How, our friends in the 12-step program call it, how fearlessly we do that inventory. How humbly we clear away what impedes our growth. Remember a little boy asking his pastor daddy one night, Saturday night, Daddy, how do you know what to write for your sermon? And the dad says, well, God tells me. Oh, that's interesting. Well, daddy, how come you're putting red lines through so much of your sermon? <laughs> how much rich soil do our lives have? And yet there's more to do if we would continue to follow, if we would, as Paul says, walk the walk following this parable of the suitable soil, how are we going to produce an abundant crop? How are we going to increase the value of our lives for the kingdom? Well, we need to do what other parables call for us to do after planting the seed. Namely, we've got to be about the tilling and the fertilizing and the pruning and providing the proper balance. Envision how this process can make your Christian walk more fruitful, how your Christian life can be richer. Let your imagination go. Search for ways to apply these metaphorical examples. Think about plowing and hoeing, for example. 
Loosening up soil and exposing it to the air might remind us to keep a fresh perspective and constantly expose ourselves to new and different insights about God, what God has in store for us in every situation. Might I humbly suggest that we collectively turn off the TV and open our Bibles? Go ahead, read this year's bestseller, and then read two classics. That was C.S. Lewis's rule. And then come and ask. I'd love to offer a couple suggestions that might help you. That'd be awesome. Number two, where does your fertilizer come from? Hannity? Blitzer? Colbert? Cooper? What seed are they feeding? What are they doing to the soil that is your soul? How often do you tune in to your priest? What's keeping you from delving as deeply into Scripture as you do the news or the Internet? Yes, read the Bible, but here's a clarion call. Don't do it alone. Remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? The eunuch had been to Jerusalem to worship, and he was headed home. He was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah, and Philip asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I understand unless I have a teacher to teach me? And he asked Philip to teach him, and Philip taught him the gospel. And the Ethiopian asked to be baptized. And the history in Ethiopia is that man brought the faith to them. If we don't read Scripture with our brothers and sisters, if we don't read the Scriptures with a teacher standing in the unbroken stream of apostolic faith, we wind up with feel-good drivel. And we also need to listen to the stories of the saints. Find examples in them. We could draw incredible inspiration from them if we knew them. You think we're the only ones who've had to endure hardship for what we believe? Emulate them. Follow in their steps. Number three, what about pruning? We need to deadhead what's gone by and what's not good. We need to keep and nurture what's growing, what's most in keeping with God, and cut away what's not. Finally, Taking a lesson from modern agriculture, we understand that there's supposed to be a proper ratio of acid to base in the soil. Many of our lives are far too basic. It's time maybe to take the training wheels off of our bicycles. And some of us are far too acidic. <laughs> Balance is critical. For instance, it's not a matter just of worship and prayer versus good works and social action, and vice versa. It's not just about good works and social action. It's about worship and prayer. It has to be about both, each informing the other, finding the right priority for the given moment, emphasizing what love demands at a certain time. These can produce an abundance of goodness, and they're beautiful. But we need to keep these many aspects of our Christian life in balance. God created us good, and as we invite the Father to sow the seed of his Son in our hearts, we're given every potential to find fullness of life. But remember, please, God provides all we need for this. We can't manufacture it on our own. I kind of think it's like a trip to the grocery store. If we just go in far enough to stand at the checkout counter, looking at the gossip rags and the horoscopes, eating the candy bars and drinking the energy drinks, how healthy is that? Well, I'm in the store. Finally, please, 
once again, never forget. God not only produces the growth. Do you believe that God wants you to grow? In the spiritual life? There's so much for us to do with the gift of our lives that God provides. But hold on to the hope. It ain't going to happen overnight, is it? You're going to... I shared this before. I gave up playing the piano because I figured out I wasn't going to be able to play Brahms in 10 days. It's going to take time. It's going to take active thought, and it's going to take walking the walk. And then that yield, no matter what it is, no matter how small or how great, it's the love that grows. And we have to put His love for us to use so that we'll be enriched. What else will be enriched as we are enriched with God's gifts? Maybe the contrary is a shorter answer. What won't be enriched? Not a thing. Let's live our lives for God. Let's be good dirt, good dirt, so that God can grow whatever he wants to grow in our lives. Let me conclude with prayer. Grow in our lives, good God. May the seed that you plant in us bear much fruit. And then as we walk in that fertile life, send us, O oh God, as your messengers into the world, to hearts without homes, to lives without love, to the crowds who lack a guide. Send us to the children whom none have blessed, to the famished and lonely whom none have visited, to the fallen whom none have lifted, to the bereaved whom none have comforted. Kindle your flame on the altars of our hearts that others may be warmed thereby. Cause your light to shine in our souls that others may see the way. Keep our sympathies and insights ready, our wills keen, our hands quick to help our sisters and brothers in their needs. This in all things, Father, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, together and in love, let's stand and proclaim the faith of the church. The traditional Nicene Creed is found beginning on page five of your bulletin. And in love, we'll say with one voice, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You're welcome to continue to stand or to kneel at this time as we offer our prayers. 
Um, this litany was produced primarily by the folks at our national cathedral, the Washington Cathedral. And they offered this uh, litany back in March, and it has to do with us and our involvement with the pandemic. I thought it was appropriate and timely. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In this challenging and uncertain time of global pandemic and public health crisis, we come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church, and the world. For the church, that she may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serving as a beacon of hope to a suffering world. We pray for Bartholomew, Francis, Theodore, John, Theophilus, and Justin, the presiding bishop, Michael, our bishop, David, the bishops of Southeast Mexico, Honduras, and Navajo land, Julio, Lloyd, and Dave, the priest of Manos de Dios, Victor, our priests, David and Gordon, for the most reverend Alan of the Anglican Church of Papua New Guinea. And in our diocesan prayer cycle, we give thanks for Good Samaritan community services and all who minister in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all affected by coronavirus around the world, for Donald, our president, Greg, our governor, and all the leaders of the nations, that they may work together for the common good as our concerns continue to grow. May barriers that divide be brought down, that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy, grant public health and government officials in our nation the wisdom, knowledge, strength, and will to act swiftly and decisively with compassion in service to all. Again, we pray especially for Donald and the Congress, governors, and elected officials in our local municipalities. Lord, in your mercy, please heal all who are sick with the virus. May they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to all who are caring for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, as you sought refuge and asylum from the evil that threatened you, protect all seekers of asylum and refugees on our borders and around the world. Lord, in your mercy, for health care workers who, with hearts of service, stand on the front lines of providing care, Grant them courage and protection as they put the needs of public safety before their own. Lord, in your mercy. Bless scientists and researchers around the world as they fight the virus and all disease, that their work may yield knowledge to develop a vaccine, treatments, and improved measures to reduce its spread. Lord, in your mercy. For the safety and well-being of all who must travel and all who remain quarantined, Lord, in your mercy. Please, Lord, remove the fear and anxiety from our hearts so that confident in your providence, we may be generous in sharing our resources. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that all communities of faith may reflect your love as they minister to the most vulnerable among us. Fill them with your Holy Spirit as they work to be your healing hands and feet to all in need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray especially for Dale, Ward, Jimmy, and all who have already lost loved ones to the virus and those who will yet suffer such loss, that they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy. For all who serve in the armed forces, for all who face danger and conflict each day, for all victims of violence, terror, and war, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, Lord, in your mercy. For Margaret, Teo, Kaylee, Jackson, Daniel, Tommy, Freeman and Lizzie, Haley, Pat, Becky, 
Jan, Dave and Kathy, Angelina, Peggy, Shannon, Norm, Jimmy, Jacob, Mary, Joe, Jessica, Judy, Kevin, Meredith, Brian and Stacy, Helen, Sharon, Carol, Jan, Phil, Tom, Dennis, Bruce, Nathaniel, Shirley, Diane, Seal, Lynn, Susie, and Stuart, and for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, for those celebrating birthdays, Deborah Casson, Doris Marlowe, Tom O'Brien, and Chuck Schwachhofer, and those celebrating anniversaries, Bernie and Judy Fry, Dwayne and Gloria Glass, JP and Cindy Smith, Burnham Jones and Betty Colley. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Lord, in your mercy, giving thanks for the lives of all your saints, especially the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, Jude, Francis, Benedict, and William White, for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. As we pray together, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you very much. Being mindful of our physical distancing... Bless your family. That's a good thing there, Ray. And may I invite you to have a seat. I'm going to speak a little louder now because the microphone's over here for in here. Um, welcome. It is such a pleasure once again to see you who are here. We are truly grateful. And um, I was advised last week that I swung the uh, camera a little bit too quickly. And there were some people who needed some uh, motion distressness <laughs> bags after uh, I swung the camera. But these are your brothers and sisters here. Oh, sorry about that big face. Um, and there we go, everybody, pass the peace with your friends at home. Yay! Yay! They're actually uh, clamoring. You can't hear it at home, but trust me, they're just beside themselves uh, with joy over the opportunity to greet all of you at home. Um, and you only saw a little bit of sarcastic, facetious droplets falling from my face. So we have welcomed you. Um, we're about to go into the offering time. And the offertory is another one of those times where we surely present tokens of our lives. That is the fruit of our labors to the Lord. And we do that in myriad ways. At home, you're welcome to write checks to St. Francis by the Lake. Please send them to our post office box, which is 2031 here in Canyon Lake. Um, but besides our contributions, which are token amounts, like the offertory sentence says, I'm going to appeal to you to present yourselves, 
even as we preached about, spoke about today. I know that I'm preaching to the choir. You're all the choir, right? Right? Right. We have a beautiful bass voice joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to hear the beautiful sounds that are going to emanate from Ray's voice. Glad to have you with us, Ray, and I'm really glad you got to visit your mom. Um, but for the rest of us uh, at home, John and I have been working. Libby has been patient, and we think that we have fixed the balance between organ and voice. We'll see how that works. Um, so without further ado, are there other announcements that need to be made at this time? We are going to have a vestry meeting via Zoom. Uh, that'll follow our coffee hour. Uh, some of us race home and log into Zoom and participate in a virtual coffee hour. But at noon, uh, we'll give that up and yield the time to our vestry. So please pray for your leadership as we continue to do uh, the work of the church. So I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present yourselves as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. We're going to sing the offertory song uh, to the tune Rondé Adieu, which is found on page eight of your bulletin. Father, we thank thee.
Continuing on page nine of your bulletin, if you're at home and in the prayer book, we're on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever say this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we'd fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. 
with thanksgiving. For those who are here in the house, let me remind you that you may or may not choose to come forward and partake. If you'd like to come forward, the ushers will come by and uh, help you queue and maintain your distance. I'm going to be standing right here at the bottom of this step, and I would encourage you as you make it to the last blue strip that you lower your mask so that you might receive the host, and then after consuming, lift it up before you go back to your seats, okay? You're welcome to be seated until it's time for you to come forward. And for our brothers and sisters who are at home uh, and those here in the community who may be desiring to participate spiritually, I'm to remind you that the sacrament is for reasons of extreme sickness or physical disability, including quarantine, uh, if the sacrament is unable to be eaten and drunk, I, the priest, am to assure you that all benefits of communion are received even though the sacrament is not consumed. And so in solidarity with you all, I pray and invite you to pray in union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church where your blessed body and blood are being offered this day, and remembering particularly our own parish, St. Francis by the Lake, and those worshiping there, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation, for all the blessings of this life, for redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. And since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray for you to come into my heart. I pray to unite myself with you, and I embrace you with all my heart, soul, and mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life, until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Come, Lord Jesus and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness and in the power of your gracious might. Rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Jerry, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Tam, 
we're at the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Linda, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Let's join together, please, and give thanks to our gracious host. The post-communion prayer may be found on page 11 of your bulletin or in the prayer book at page 366. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor now and forever. Amen. In a moment, we'll sing hymn number 530. We've got all four verses. It's a nice, brisk tune. Gott sei Dank. Um, however, until then, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Alleluia, alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Thank you. 